one of the primary clocks that are presented is that there's strata, meaning layers, in the geological record. And that since there's millions of layers, that must represent millions of years. Well, what assumptions are being made here? Initial conditions, well, we both agree on that, both sides of the debate, is that at, at one point there were no layers, and then afterward there were. The question is, how quickly were those layers laid down? If you study geology, one of the first things you'll be taught is what's called the law of superposition. That a layer on the bottom is older than a layer on top of it. Unless you can show that there was some kind of geological activity that turned things over subsequently. But in general, as these things are being laid down, you have to lay down the bottom one before you can lay down one of the top ones. Now that seems to make sense, doesn't it? Turns out, though, it's not correct. As has been shown in the laboratory, as Jonathan mentioned, you can, sh you can show that superposition is not true. Depending on um, how much sediment's in the water, how fast the water is moving, and various other things, you can actually form a bunch of layers all at the same time. So instead of one layer being laid down and then another one on top of it, another one on top of it, you actually lay a bunch of them as the water flows sideways. This is my uh, <laughs> wonderful visual effects here. But if you can imagine that the layers represented by my fingers growing sideways, you can grow, quote unquote, a bunch of layers all at the same time. Is there any, any evidence that this has actually happened? Well, yes, there is. Uh, for one thing, we see a lot of fossils that indicate they were rap uh, uh, rapidly buried, as Jonathan mentioned earlier. This is a fish that was swallowed on the act of eating his lunch. These slides here will look familiar from the previous talk as well. This represents three depositional events. You see there's a line here and a line here. This, this, and this, they were each laid down in a matter of hours, not millions of years. And indeed, the layering even within these are very fine, as you can see. So even um, lots of layers being laid down quickly can uh, indicate short times rather than long. Jonathan also mentioned polystrate fossils, fossils that cut across multiple layers. Again, now we're collapsing the amount of time that those layers represent. The layers themselves are sometimes folded. Now, has anybody ever tried to fold a rock? Doesn't work very well, right? Yet, in various places, we see that rocks are very sharply folded. Now, it turns out that you can actually fold rock if you keep it under enough heat and pressure, but that actually does certain things to the rock. It metamorphosizes it. But in various places, we see some very sharp folding with no evidence of that occurring. For scale here, here's two people, by the way. The only way this could have happened is if all those layers were still unconsolidated. They weren't rock yet. They were still at least partially wet sediment. Well, that tells you then in turn that it didn't take millions of years, or however many layers that is, to lay all that down. It had to all have been soft at once, therefore it was all laid down at once. Now we're talking about a massive flood rather than millions of years. You see, even within the layers, there are things we would expect to see if it represented a long time. But we don't see these things. An example is bioturbation. Uh, the disturbing of this material by biological activity. For example, here in the sound, we have gooey ducks. Am I pronouncing that correctly? The fact that anybody would eat those things astounds me. But anyway, <laughs> what, what, do, what do they do? I mean, they, they burrow into the bottom of the sound, right? When you have a layer that's exposed to an oceanic or a water environment, you have plants growing, you have clams and everything else digging and burrowing, there's evidence that this occurred later. Well, we don't often see bioturbation in the record. That would indicate that those layers were not actually exposed to water very long. Jonathan mentioned uh, footprints, ripple marks, and other things that we would not expect to see if those layers had been exposed for long periods of time before being covered up by something else. We also have things like this. It's hard to see from the back, I apologize, but this is actually a uni unique kind of fossil. It's a dinosaur fossil, but it's not a bone. It's called a coprolite. And I get a few knowing grins here from people in the audience. Uh, when I give school talks, I like to pass this around to the kids and ask them to figure out what it is. And I ask them if it has a smell or like this, try to figure it out. This is fossilized dinosaur dung. And it's, it's fun seeing their expressions when, when I, I reveal that fact to them after they've been handling it. Um, now, if the neighbor's dog leaves one of these deposits in your yard, does it sit there for years and years until gradual layers of sediment cover it up and it becomes a fossil? Or does insect, wind, rain, and other activity dissipate it fairly quickly? Well, you would think that if 
it took long periods of time to lay down these layers, you wouldn't see this kind of stuff, but we do find a lot of it. There are paleontologists who specialize in this. <laughs> yeah. I saw one had a whole table full of the stuff. Now, this one is kind of squished. Maybe the, di maybe the dinosaur had diarrhea or something. Um, but these particular specimens, I mean, it looked like what it was. So, and then they're sawing it open and trying to figure out, you know, what it contained and, yeah. <laughs> Strange way to make a living. My point is, as I hope is obvious, is this stuff would indicate that it was all buried fairly, fairly quickly. So millions of layers does not indicate millions of years. Do the canyons that we see exposed here require millions of years to form? Jonathan talked about this as well, so I won't spend too much time on it. Flowing water has tremendous destructive force. Uh, there's various mechanisms for erosion, and the more, the more water and the faster it's moving, the worse it gets. Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, this is a spillway tunnel that was opened basically beyond its design capacity because the reservoir behind it was building up to dangerous levels. In a period of a couple days, catastrophic uh, cavitation started occurring here, and several feet of steel, of, uh, steel rebar reinforced concrete was eaten through by erosion and then down into the rock. Mount St. Helens, I believe Jonathan had this slide as, uh, as well. These canyons formed very quickly. Burlingham Canyon, this canyon system formed in six days. Canyon Lake Gorge formed in three days. There's lots of examples of catastrophic erosion causing canyons to form in a fairly short period of time. So no, a canyon does not require millions of years or long periods of time. In fact, as Jonathan also mentioned, which came first, the canyon or the river? Well, the canyon came first, and then this little river is here now because water flows downhill, of course. So if you had this big gash in the ground, that's where the water flows into. Moving onwards, we have radiometric dating. Now, this is a big one, of course, and this is the one that the evolutionists think they got it all locked in. This proves without a doubt that everything is old. How does this work? Well, as an example, we'll take uranium, symbol U, to lead, PB. That system has a half-life of about four and a half billion years, give or take. What does that mean? That means if you, if you started out with a brick of uranium and you waited four and a half billion years, that half of it would turn into lead. Now, in real life, it wouldn't be half on the bottom, half on top. It, they'd be scattered throughout, but I'm doing this for illustration purposes. So after one half-life, half of what you started with is gone and turned into the daughter product. After another half-life, half of what you had is gone as well. And so it goes. So the idea is that by measuring the ratio of parent to daughter, we can figure out how long it's been since the system started at zero. But again, we're not dealing with clocks or watches here. We're dealing with hourglasses. You have to make assumptions. In this case, both assumptions can be challenged. You have to assume that the rate of decay of transforming one element to another has been constant, and you have to assume that you know the initial conditions. More specifically, in this case, the assumptions that have to be made is that there's no change in the rate, as I mentioned a moment ago. You have to assume that no daughter element was present in the beginning for some of these methods. You also have to assume that no parent or daughter element was added to or subtracted from the system. More explicitly here, if you had a change in the decay rate, then you can't say how long it was to produce the system that you see here, can you? It would depend on what the rate was in the past. Also, too, if you, have to, if you assume here that there's no daughter in, initially, if there was a daughter, it makes the, the uh, sample look old, doesn't it? Because you say, well, in this contrived example, you say this is half and half, so it must be four and a half billion years old. Well, actually, no, it could be very young. Maybe it had lead to begin with. Since you weren't there when it was formed, you don't know whether or not that's true or not. In, in similar form, if you add daughter or subtract daughter from the system, or change the amount of parent in the system, again, you get something that's not reflective of its true age. Now, there are some technical details here, and there are some methods that try to avoid making some of these assumptions. To do that, however, they need to make additional assumptions, and I don't want to bore anybody. So let's just ask a more obvious question. Does it work? If you take a, a rock and you date it multiple ways, do you get consistent answers? Well, here's a cutaway view of the Grand Canyon. Now, creationists and evolutionists argue about how long it's been since the system was formed, but both agree on the relative order that things happened. These layers down here were laid down first. Then there was some kind of an erosional event that cut across this way, 
Then further layers were laid down. Then there was massive erosion here that caused the Grand Canyon itself. And last of all, volcanic activity up here had this formation that trickles down into the canyon. Now, people have taken samples from various places and submitted them for dating. And it's interesting when you realize that this basaltic rock here, produced by the volcanoes in the top, which everybody agrees is the youngest of the whole system, when you date it different ways, you get a wide, wide range of ages, going from 10,000 years all the way up to 2.6 billion years for the same rock. Take a, uh, take a sample from down here, submit that, you get a range of 791 to 1.07 billion. Notice that the oldest age up here is actually older than the oldest age for the one down below. And there's a, a lot of examples of this in creationist material, as I'm sure some of you have seen. Steve Austin took a sample from the uh, Mount St. Helens lava dome. Now we know when this thing formed. He submitted it for potassium to argon dating, which is specifically designed to tell you how long it's been since lava hardened into rock. The age he got back for the lava dome was 340,000 to 2.8 million years, when in reality it was six years old at the time he sent it in. Now, I saw an atheist uh, blowing steam on this on the internet saying, well, He's, he's being deceptive about the whole thing because everybody knows that potassium argon can't work unless the sample is X amount old. And that since he knew it was very young, he should have known it would have produced these erroneously old ages. I said, well, no, that's the whole point. <laughs> the whole point is that the age, all, that this, this method always gives you old ages even when it is young. So if, when you test a method using young rocks and it tells you old ages, why should you believe the old ages for a rock that you don't already know the age of? Right? Other examples of this. There's a crater in Arizona. La, um, formed in 1065, potassium argon says it's 210,000 years old. Sample from there. Lava flows in New Zealand. Various methods here. The sample is only about 50 years old at the time. You can see the wide range of ages that it got. Notice for you geology geeks here, some of these are isochron ages, which are supposed to eliminate some of the assumptions I mentioned earlier. Yet they still produce ages that are millions of years too high. In this case, 3.9 billion years for a sample that was about 50 years old. Basalt in Hawaii, similar thing. Only a couple hundred years old, but we got ages of up to 22 million. Now, some people say, okay, so some of these methods may have some problems. Nevertheless, though, they still consistently produce ages up in the millions of years. So doesn't that still show that things are young? Not necessarily. Again, we're making assumptions here, so let's look at that. I'm showing you here some zircon crystals. Now, those, um, I assume, this is a dangerous word to use in this presentation, I'm assuming that there's some copies of the, the rate materials out on the book tables out there, if anybody wants more details of what I'm about to talk about. But there was a long project that looked at the decay within zircon crystals of uranium. And it turns out that to go from uranium-238 to lead-206, along that decay chain, eight helium atoms are produced. It also turns out that in the particular zircon crystals that were studied, there's a lot of excess helium. Now, this is interesting because helium, of course, is a very small molecule and very light. I mean, that's why helium balloons float, right? And helium can migrate through rock fairly easily. So if these rocks were actually old, there should not have been this much helium still within them, but there was. The scientists who studied this actually plotted out and said, well, the creation model that says these rocks are only 6,000 years old would indicate that helium diffuses out of the rock at this certain rate. And here's the graph for that. Conversely, if these rocks were billions of years old, helium would have to diffuse much more slowly than we would otherwise think would be the case. And it would indicate down here. So they actually sent off for testing to find out what the diffusion rate of helium is in this particular circumstance. And the data came back that matched up, as you can see, very consistently with the creation prediction, off by a factor of 100,000 with the deep time model. My point in all this is that there is evidence that there has been a lot of decay, radioactive decay, in the past. That's why all the helium is there. There's other evidence for this as well, fission tracks and radio halos and some other things. But that decay apparently happened in a very short time because the helium is still there. It hasn't had time to leak out yet. 